Good evening, everyone. Let's start for this evening. We'll open with a word of prayer, then we'll have some worship, and then we'll get into our Bible study this evening. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just come before you now. We ask your blessing uh, upon this time, Lord. We pray that you would minister to our needs. We pray that you would meet with us uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to stand.
hope everyone's enjoyed the weather today. Yeah, very nice. If you've been at work, you probably haven't, sorry. Um, Isaiah chapter 19. Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah 19. I'll do a quick recap of what we did last week, and then we'll carry on through Isaiah 19. It's quite a long chapter, but we are going to just read quite big chunks of it before we do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, now as we just open your word again. We pray that you'll speak to us. We pray that you'll show us your truth, Lord, and that you would reveal your son to us in even greater ways, even through this text, Lord, as we speak on the subject of Egypt tonight. In Jesus' name. So we are going through the book of Isaiah. If you remember now for the last kind of like five or six weeks, I guess, we've been looking at the section of the book that details all of these prophecies and histories of the surrounding Gentile nations to do with Israel. We've seen many of them. Last week, we dealt with an unusual one, the Cushite Empire or the Ethiopian Empire, the Ethiopians. We did a a brief survey of some of the history of the Askum Kingdom, which is the the great Ethiopian kingdom that existed at this time that most people don't know about. Uh, It was a very powerful kingdom, and I shared with you some of the interesting history about uh, some of the Ethiopian, uh, well, they still believe it today, traditions that exist today, uh, namely that when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon, who was an Ethiopian, she went to see King Solomon and uh, was amazed by all of his wisdom. But the Ethiopians today also believe that uh, she came back pregnant and she gave birth to King Melanic I, who is the first of the Solomonic dynasty of the Ethiopian kings. And they take that quite seriously. The Ethiopian kings only died out at the end with Halle Selesi and the, that's the, the man who the Rastafarians worship as God. And you can see that it's a very interesting history, obviously quite confused in many ways, but quite fascinating in many ways too. And then we looked at another famous Ethiopian who went to Jerusalem. We kept seeing this theme that Ethiopians are going to flock to Jerusalem and meet the king. This is what will happen in the kingdom. This is what the Queen of Sheba did. This is also what the Ethiopian eunuch did in the book of Acts. Do you remember that? If you read that narrative carefully, you'll realise he'd just come, well, he'd just been to Jerusalem and he was, was on his way out of Jerusalem where he stopped and he started reading a particular book of the Bible. He was reading the prophet Isaiah and he was reading about the king and he did meet the king of kings there the lord the holy spirit had a disciple there named philip who was told to go and explain to him who he was reading about so it seems to be that when these ethiopians go to jerusalem they meet the king and that's kind of what we spoke about a lot last uh, last time the idea was basically the warning of the prophecy of chapter 18 is to the israelites do not make an alliance with the ethiopians Although they were quite a friendly kingdom to Israel, the point was you don't need to make an alliance with this uh, Gentile nation. You should just be trusting in the Lord and that would be enough. The Assyrians won't be able to take you. I made the point, remember, we saw it quite a few chapters back. The Lord had already promised that the Assyrians would not take Jerusalem. So they did not need to be making alliances for their own security. They had the security of the Lord's promise. And that should have been enough. That's the whole point of really of that chapter and kind of the whole point underlying all of these passages here. We're going to see it again now in the book of Egypt. So we turn to the nation of Egypt in Isaiah 19. Uh, Egypt, one of the most talked about nations in the Bible, really, uh, especially as their history interlocks with Israel right back from the beginning. Of course, they were the oppressors of the Israelites in the book of Exodus. And they initiated four separate wars against Israel in that period, uh, well, the following years in the Bible, uh, they're featured heavily in the narrative of the Bible. And interestingly, modern Israel is no different. If you go from 1948, when Israel became a nation in the land again, just like it was in the ancient times, the nation of Egypt was right, right there ready to attack. And they have actually also fought four wars with Israel since coming into being. 1948, the War of Independence, Egypt and their allies attacked. 1953, the Suez Canal debacle, that was Egypt. And Israel, 1967, the Six Day War, that was of course Egypt again. 1973, the Yom Kippur War, that was Egypt, along with others obviously. Modern history seems to be exactly the same. They are a long time enemy of Israel and that's what makes this chapter very interesting in many ways. If you remember, like we've seen going through these prophecies of the Gentile nations, the prophet Isaiah seems to fluctuate between speaking of their their near destruction or judgment at the hand of the Assyrians and then, almost without a breath, skips to speaking about the final fulfilment and the kingdom age. This happens all the way through the book of Isaiah. 
Uh, and in between these moments, you'll often find him interspersing a kind of redemptive hope, either talking about the Messiah or talking about the salvation of the peoples. We'll see that uh, hugely in this chapter as we go through. So the idea is, do not go to Egypt. They will not be able to help you either. And we'll see uh, that warning repeated throughout this book. And we're going to find out when we get to like chapter 37 that there was a whole group of people in Israel telling the king, you need to go to Egypt and try and make an alliance with them. And once again, the Lord is bringing a word not to do that. So let's read the first four verses. It says, the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. And so I will incite Egyptian against Egyptian, and they will each fight against his brother and each against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. And then the spirit of the Egyptians will be demoralized within them, and I will confound their strategy, so that they will resort to idols and ghosts of the dead, and to mediums and spiritists. Moreover, I will deliver the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel master, and a mighty king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. So we see here... The Lord riding on a swift cloud, a picture of judgment. You'll find that imagery throughout the Bible. The Lord coming on a swift cloud is often a, a sort of picture of judgment. And of course, one day it will be uh, literally coming on the clouds of heaven when he comes with his second coming. It says the idols of Egypt. I mean, you remember the book of Exodus, the ten plagues and all, all of that narrative there. All of those ten plagues, as we have talked about before, were directed against particular Egyptian gods. They worshipped the water, they worshipped the Nile, they worshipped frogs, they had lice god, they had all sorts of different things. No nation was so gripped in idolatry as Egypt. And they had serious dark arts going on in Egypt, uh, real occult stuff going on. Um, as they, you can see here as they turn to the spirits of ghosts and spirits of the dead. And it's interesting to know that the Bible doesn't actually refute in many ways these sorts of things. It quite often just mentions them matter-of-factly. They had a very spiritual worldview at this time. The Egyptians were very much into the dark arts and they were known for it and they had a lot of wisdom that came from it, worldly wisdom, occult wisdom obviously, but they were known all around the ancient world for being that sort of a people. And the Lord here says, if you notice, it says the heart of the Egyptians will melt. It's another way of saying the whole nation is going to be gripped with fear basically. And then it says he'll turn Egyptian against Egyptian, so civil war will break out. Their spirit, it says, will be demoralized and then in desperation. They'll turn to idols, to ghosts of the dead, to mediums, and to spiritualists. And this I find quite interesting. Uh, what is going to happen, this is the Assyrian invasion that's going to take over Egypt. That's the idea. They're scared of that. The Lord is bringing that judgment upon them. They're demoralized. They're fearful. They're not listening to the Lord. They are listening. And where do they turn? They turn to the false gods. And I find this interesting. Never be surprised what people will turn to when they reject God. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I've seen it many times. So this text is generally talking about on a national basis. Um, and we don't have to go too far to go around the history of the world to see what did happen in many places in the world before the gospel landed on their shores and what still happens in many places that are where the gospel is still banned and not allowed to penetrate in some areas today. But I'd also say personally, if you've ever known someone personally, particularly someone who, shouldn't, who knows the Lord, if they get into that stage in their life through backsliding or through whatever it may be and they start to reject the word of the Lord, as we've seen, that was Israel's problem. They knew the Lord, they had the word of the Lord, but they started to desire the things in the nations that they were looking at. And thus, when you start to do that, almost by the other side of the coin, kind of, you start to reject the word of the Lord and then you start to put other things in its place. And I would say there's probably no, nothing you would not put in its place once you've finally rejected the Lord. And that is, again, why we constantly have this call of the prophets to listen, hear, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. That's why the Lord is speaking. So that's just a warning that we can all take to heart today. Verse 5. The waters from the sea will dry up. The river will be parched and dry. The canals will emit a stench. The streams of Egypt will thin out and dry up. The reeds and the rushes will rot away. The bulrushes by the Nile, by the edge of the Nile, and all the sown fields by the Nile will become dry, be driven away, and be no more. And the fishermen will lament. 
and all those who cast a line into the Nile will mourn, and those who spread nets on the waters will pine away. Moreover, the manufacturers of linen made from combined flax and the weavers of white cloth will be utterly dejected, and the pillars of Egypt will be crushed. All the hired laborers will be grieved in soul. So this is just, again, continuing the effects. When the nation is uh, in disarray, when they're seeking the counsel of the demonic world, when they're scared, fearful, uh, and all the fighting amongst themselves, the judgment will also affect their economy, it will affect their physical things. The Lord says he'll dry the Nile. Their whole life was based upon the Nile, basically. Uh, that's where all of their industry came from. That's why they worshipped it in many ways. Without the Nile, the nation dries up. All of their trades dry up. The, the, the flax, the manufacturing, all these things come from that. It was the lifeblood of the nation. So this destroys their way of life and their economy too. Let's just carry on reading because there's quite a lot of this. The princes of Zoan, verse 11, are mere fools. The advice of Pharaoh's wisest advisers has become stupid. How can you men say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Well then, where are your wise men? Please let them tell you, and let them understand what the Lord of hosts had purposed against Egypt. The princes of Zoan have acted foolishly. The princes of Memphis are deluded. Those who are the cornerstone of her tribes have led Egypt astray. The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of distortion, they have led Egypt astray in all that it does as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. There will be no work for Egypt, which its head or tail, its palm branch or bulrush may do. So following on, if you can imagine the situation, after being demoralized, divided by civil war, seeking demonic wisdom, having drought, economic despair, now we see uh, that they move into a period of what is best called delusion. It says the princes are fools. It's a very strong word, and it says their advice has become stupid. <laughs> very blah, I like the way the prophet just puts it there. It's stupid, right? This thing is stupid. The wise of the day in this nation that is now under divine wrath were unable to help. And that's an important thing, because we often look up to the wise of the day, don't we? It makes me think a little bit about what's happened to our education in, I'd say our country, but probably more, more uh, correctly, the Western world. You know the old motto for Oxford University? used to be, the Lord is my light. The university founded for Christian purposes. Just last year, I don't know if you followed, there was a big hoo-ha at Oxford University because they kicked out a uh, Christian conference from being held in one of their chapels, uh, basically because the liberal element didn't agree with the, some of the values of that particular group who were doing it. And they're a good view, it's a conference that I would have gone to myself. Um, just a good Christian uh, apologetics type conference, and they were cancelled, but this was the university, the Lord is my light, is no longer applying in this area. We go over to the States, Harvard University, founded in 1692. They had a motto. Their motto was truth for Christ and for the church. They had a book called The Rules and Precepts, which was basically the founding purpose of this university, which is one of the Ivy Leagues today. 1646, let me read to you two sections from it. This was basically their whole purpose of being, and this is what every student was required to do. It said, number two, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. Point three. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein, both in theoretical observations of language and logic, and in practical and spiritual truths, as his tutor shall require. According to his ability, seeing the entrance of the word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. And on and on it kind of goes, really. And that, that was what, what Harvard was to look, uh, basically founded on. Now, modern Harvard... One of the first things they did, I forget the actual date that they did this, that they wanted to change that, so they changed their motto and they took it out. It was truth for Christ and for the church. They got rid of Christ, they got rid of church, and they just had truth. And instead of three Bibles, they just had three open books to indicate mankind's wisdom uh, is never-ending, basically. Human reason, human truth, that's what they did. And as I think of that, and I see you could repeat that story for many universities uh, and education around the world, it just makes me think here of this verse. Egypt were the wisest men. They were famous for their wisdom. You even see this in the Bible, 1 Kings 4.30, where it says Solomon's wisdom 
surpass the wisdom of all the sons of the, the East and even all the wisdom of Egypt. Just gives you an idea that Solomon, obviously, wisdom from the Lord is the whole point. But wisdom of Egypt was very uh, revered in the ancient world. They prided themselves on it. They had their wise men and their magicians and all these people. And he challenges them, Isaiah here. He basically says, tell them, if you've got so many wise men, let these wise men tell you what the Lord has purposed against your nation, against Egypt. And the point is, obviously, they can't do that because their wisdom is from the world. It is useless for this task. If I put that in today's language, if I was being a little, a little mean, it's basically saying all of your gender studies, uh, your PhDs in sexuality and gender, are not really going to help you at this point. That's not the point of education here. That's what it means. All these dark arts, these occult things that you're studying, these wise men that you have, they can do nothing to help you because the Lord has spoken. The Lord's word is the end. And also he's warning Israel here, don't go to Egypt, because when you go to Egypt, you're going to get involved with their wisdom. And if you are aware of the way that Egypt is used in the Bible, I find this fascinating because Egypt is often used as a picture of the world, um, with Pharaoh obviously as the king of the world in many ways in that sense. But when you go to Egypt and make an alliance, it is undoubt it's, you, know, you are going to be involved with the wisdom of Egypt at some point. You will get corrupted by it or you will seek it and that's just the way it goes. That's why the Lord warns us so many times. There is somewhere that we are supposed to go for wisdom, and we are told this also many times in the scripture. God's people go to a different place. And I'm not talking about wisdom in the sense of practical skills that people might have in the world, or just things that are general knowledge in the whole world. This is obviously referring to uh, wisdom in the sense of combining the spiritual and the physical together into our worldview. But we go to the Lord for wisdom and counsel, don't we? And if we don't have wisdom, it says in the book of James, we ask God for wisdom. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we find this revealed in his word. And that, I believe, is the thought behind these chapters here. Don't go to Assyria, don't go to Ethiopia, and now don't go to Egypt. None of these big, powerful nations, with all of their strength and their glitz and their glamour and all of the things that they offer, none of them are going to help you because they're about to be judged. That's the whole point. So now we move pace in the text, and it seems like we look into the future a little bit here. And you can pick up on this, like all the prophets do, they use that expression, in that day, which is often used to speak of that future day, in that day, the day of the Lord, or in that day, sometimes referring to the millennium. And hopefully as we read through, you'll see why I believe this is giving a little glimpse into the future. It says verse 16, In that day, the Egyptians will become like women, and they will tremble and be in dread because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he is going to wave over them. The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which he is purposing against them. So it says Egypt will be afraid, not, not of the Lord per se, but it actually says of the land of Judah. This is referring to the people of Israel. The people of Israel will become a terror to Egypt. Even the mention of their name will bring great dread to Egypt. It's kind of similar to the Exodus narrative. If you read the Exodus narrative, narrative in the book of Exodus, you'll find that in the end, after all the plagues, the people were just like, the Egyptians were like, get out of here. Take all, this, take all of our stuff and go, just please leave. They were fearful of the Israelites. Now for most of Israel's history, except for that brief period in the Exodus, but for most of the nation's history, they've really been in the shadow of Egypt. They were, they were a small empire sandwiched in between the big Assyrians and the Egyptians on the south, the Assyrians on the north, and these big other empires, it's basically saying at some point that is going to be reversed. And you can see a glimpse of this even in modern Israeli history. If you read many of the narratives about the Six Day War and about the War of Independence, the Egyptians became very fearful because they outnumbered the Israelis almost 10 to 1 in tanks and aircraft and weapons and soldiers and everything. They were so outnumbered, but yet every battle the Israelis won. And it ended up sort of having like this, you know, there were dramatic stories of divine interventions throughout those wars. And that traveled around the, the Near East to the point that a few years after the last attempt that they had in 1973, where they, the Egyptians were beaten, they made a peace treaty with Israel. And I find that quite, quite interesting. And they have actually had a peace treaty with Israel ever since. It doesn't mean they're friendly, but they, they have abided by that treaty. Verse 18. 
In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts, and one will be called the city of destruction. And this is interesting. Five cities in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan. At this time, that was Hebrew, and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. This has not happened yet. This is why I say this is going to happen. At some point, five cities probably representative of many more at this time. I want to digress a little bit here because... Uh, I want to talk about one of these cities. It says, one city will be called the city of destruction. That's what my Bible says. Some of your Bibles might read the city of sun, the city of the sun there, which is actually a slightly better um, translation because that's, a, that's an actual city in Egypt. Um, in Hebrew, there's literally like half a brush stroke difference between those two words on a manuscript. So it's very easy to see why people weren't sure when they translated this. But the city of the sun is known as Heliopolis in the Greek or the Roman word, rather. Um, it's the city of the sun. It's a big, it was a big center, a big city in Egypt. Now, I want to digress. I'm sure I shared this actually like three or four years ago with the church. But for those of you that weren't here, I'm going to share it again. If you go back about three and a half thousand years into the ancient Egyptian empire, the city of Heliopolis, the city of the sun, it was a major religious center. It had one of the biggest temples there uh, that worshipped Ra, the sun god. And it had this uh, massive temple. Actually, uh, Caleb, if you could stick the, the temple picture up for me. Uh, in front of its great temple were these three huge pillars. Um, there's only one there today, but you can see. I want to take you back. Let me read to you Genesis 46, verse 20, just to so you know how far back this goes. And to Joseph, in the land of Egypt, were born Manasseh, Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, Potiphera, the priest of On, bore to him. So this is taking us all the way back to the time of Joseph, you know, whilst the children of Israel were being born. It says that Joseph married the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. On is another word for this same city, the city of Sun. It's more of the Egyptian Coptic word. Uh, and it's still referred to as that today. The priest of On. So that's Genesis 46. So this is fascinating, that, and that's what the temple, you can see those obel obelisks there. There were three of those, it was a very famous temple, uh, this one here. It is very likely that the patriarchs, all of them, would have seen and been past that building. Moses grew up in these areas, he most definitely would have known about the temple dedicated to Ra, and would have seen it, most of the Israelites would have too. Later in its history, Alexander the Great conquered this area. He stopped in this city, and during his reign, actually, it flourished. It was a great seat of learning. Many of the Greek philosophers, Homer, Plato, Pythagoras, Aristotle, they all would have been familiar with that temple, would have walked past those pillars. Then Rome took over. Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar, all of these people, they also had a great interest in this city. They all would have known it. They would have known those particular things there. Then around 1400 years uh, later, this was during the time of the Romans, there were three pillars originally. There's still one there today, as you can see. The Romans took the other two pillars and they moved them up to Alexandria in northern Egypt, which was where they were sort of making their capital at that point, a good place. So they moved two of these pillars up there. And there they stayed, really, until for hundreds of years, or thousands of years, until the year 1819, so this jumps us into the 19th century, when uh, they were gifted to the United Kingdom, one of them was anyway, by Egypt's then ruler Muhammad Ali. Uh, this was basically to congratulate him. This was the time when Lord Nelson won a, a, a battle there when Napoleon was trying to take over Egypt. The British intervened and they won a battle at this place. And as a gift, uh, the ruler of Egypt gave one of these obelisks to the UK. And just remind you, this is one of these obelisks that dates back three and a half thousand years, of which most people are pretty certain our patriarchs would have been familiar with and would have seen. And it stands now, if you can ever see it, if you go to the next picture, Caleb, if you've ever been on the banks of the River Thames in London, that is in fact the obelisk of the city of the sun mentioned here in the book of Isaiah that dates back three and a half thousand years that Moses, that Joseph, his wife, the patriarchs 
Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Aristotle, Plato, Pythagoras, all would have known about and would be familiar with. I don't know about you, but I thought you could walk past that in London and have absolutely no idea how far that dates back into history and the sort of things that that thing has seen. It's quite amazing. And what's even more uh, uh, curious and interesting is when it came, obviously, in the 1819th, that was sort of the height of the Christian, Victorian, evangelical kind, kind of era, one of the things that they did when they put it there is they decided to put a time capsule underneath it. I'm sure I've told you this before, but one of the things that they put in the time capsule was they had a whole committee from the Bible Society choose a Bible verse that would get put in that time capsule underneath this Egyptian obelisk that is an obelisk dedicated to Ra, which is interestingly enough, the sun god. And one of the, the verse that they chose was John 3.16. So they wrote John 3.16 in uh, about 215 languages, I believe, and they put it in a time capsule. And it's still there today, along with various other things that they put in the time capsule underneath uh, the Thames there today. I don't know about you, I just find that very, very curious, that we have that little reminder in our city of these prophecies and these times and of the history that we obviously are, her our heritage, basically, biblical heritage. And that's how it goes. But... That's a digression, if you like, that sort of thing. Let's can continue in uh, chapter 19. We're only going to finish this chapter today, and we're going to do a, short, a shorter study today, and a short one next week, as it's a very small chapter too. Verse 19. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord near its border. And it will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a saviour and a champion and he will deliver them and thus the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians he will know the Lord in that day they will even worship with sacrifice and offering and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it the Lord will strike Egypt uh, strike it with healing so they will return to the Lord and he will respond to them and heal them this is an unusual text again it seems to speak of a national conversion of Egypt um, we're all kind of familiar with the concept of a national conversion of Israel. We speak about that a lot. But here we see um, a national conversion of some sort in Egypt to come after judgment. So ultimately we know even for this enemy of Israel, there is hope even for Egypt. And he will send them a saviour and a champion. It's a great word that for the Messiah. A saviour and a champion. I like that. We don't speak about champions too often. It's good to have a champion. We need a champion. And I believe this is the same one that was written about in John 3.16. It now testifies to that, sitting under that Egyptian obelisk there in our country today. And it seems to imply, talking about here, this, this altar to the Lord, this kind of fits with the worship that we're going to see in the millennium as the nations uh, worship the Lord in Jerusalem. Verse 23, In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. So in the future, it seems to be saying here that there will be peace between these ancient enemies, a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now, they did have this historically. There was a specific trade route that would link all of these three nations. It's not there today. It's been closed off, and their borders are all closed in these areas today, and they still are basically enemies with Israel at this time. But it seems to be implying that a day will come when they are turning to the Lord, and in that future day, they will actually be travelling along the road together, worshipping the Lord together. Now, that's quite a statement when you think about that. Egypt, Egyptians and the Assyrians, these two ancient enemies of Israel, will in fact be travelling up to Israel in order to worship the Lord at some point. And again, this fits with the, the millennial period as we know it. And notice he says, blessed is Egypt, my people. Now that's a very unusual phrase. Nowhere else in the entire Bible is that phrase used of any nation except Israel. This is the only exception that we have here, and we don't really know why. Maybe it's because Israel, uh, Egypt has such a long-running history. They're one of the first oppressors of Israel that we see in the Bible. 
And in, in that way, I find it quite amazing. It speaks of the universal blessing that will come to the world in the kingdom age. You see, what we're seeing here, although God is giving judgment, he also is giving grace at this time. And the future is one of hope for Egypt if they turn to the Lord. The grace here reaches even to the worst sinners. It reaches even to the enemies of God. What does grace do? Grace sends a saviour and a champion to this world. And grace brings reconciliation between nations, people and their God. And thus through that it also brings reconciliation between neighbours, brothers, sisters, whatever it may be, relationships. Grace also brings unity in worship, as we see there, these three nations joining together to worship the Lord. And grace brings blessings to others, because as we shall read as we go further, this whole thing actually impacts the entire world as they are worshipping the Lord at this time. So as we will close there, to be honest tonight, because that's the whole chapter, one of the things that as I was really dwelling on, how does this apply for us today, and we see what the Lord does in the midst of these things, sending a champion, sending a saviour, sending his grace to bring people to himself, to reconcile to himself, to bring unity between broken relationships, to even reconcile enemies, nations that are just bitter, uh, have hatred one another going back for thousands of years. God's grace sorts that out and now we see them travelling together. That's God's grace that does that. And one of the ways that I think we can apply this to ourselves today is to just ask ourselves, are we also vessels of God's grace now? Because that is one of the things we are called to be, that is one of the purposes of the New Testament church, to bring God's grace to this world. And if we are, we should see similar sorts of things happening. We should be ones that tell of a saviour. We don't send the saviour, but we know that saviour, we know that champion, we know he brings reconciliation. We know he can even bring bitter enemies one to another. We know he can bring unity. We know he can bring salvation. And ultimately, we know he will bless the world. And often, I think, well, I know in my own life anyway, there are times when you don't really feel like you are a vessel of God's grace like that. Uh, for me, I think it's because the world just fights us on that, doesn't it? It tries to get in our way at every single turn. Every single thing that we have seems to be pushing us away from that. And this is why it's so important that we actually heed the underlying message of this entire chapter and the ones that have gone preceding it, which is, the Lord has already spoken. You need to trust his word. All these other places, Egypt, Assyria, Ethiopia, they're going to come and they are going to offer great help great assistance it's going to be very logical sometimes it's going to seem like the best thing to do but when you take that it'll mean you've walked away from the lord and thus you can't be a vessel of grace in many ways now i say that in one sense obviously we know in the ultimate sense we're all trophies of god's grace towards us because none of us are worthy of what god has done for us and all of us fall short probably on a daily basis, if, I, if, if we can all be honest with ourselves, and we should interact with the grace of God because of that on a daily basis, which means we should take that verse to heart where it says we forgive much because we are forgiven much. We are forgiven daily, aren't we, as Christians, when we come before the Lord every day. We need to come before the grace of God and really uh, understand what it is, and thus we're ready to be vessels of grace, and we should pray and expect to see these things happen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word. We just pray that you continue to teach us and instruct us, Lord, that we would be better ambassadors for you. We do pray that we would be rooted in grace, that we would understand your grace, and we pray that we would be vessels of your grace to all of those around us, Lord, that they may glimpse the Saviour through us, Lord, if you give us that privilege. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.